Grace and peace be unto you this morning. Would you pray with me? Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Well, if Peter had had a journal, this is probably what it would have said after the transfiguration. Today was one of those days. I meant well, I really did. Had the chance to go with Jesus. James and John went, they were along for the ride, to climb a mountain, something I've always wanted to do, but have been too busy to take the time. I've wondered what it might be like, the view from the top. No sooner had we reached the top and caught our breath when I turned around to see Jesus shining. Truly, he was shining like when I was out on the boat and he looked directly at the sun on a cloudless day. One minute he's just Jesus. The next, his entire face was shining. And that dusty old tunic he always wears had become completely white. But that wasn't all. I also saw Moses and Elijah standing there talking to Jesus. It was amazing. And so, of course, I had lots of questions I wanted to ask them. I've heard their stories all my life. And there they stood so close I could reach out and touch them. Was this really fulfillment of what I had been predicted for so long. So I offered to build them a tent, each of them, proper places to worship, and we could all stay as long as necessary. Why rush into anything? Well, that's when things got really bizarre. I was still talking. Seems like I never know when to stop. And a bright cloud covered all three of them up a very mysterious voice, and I don't think it was Jesus, said, This is my son, whom I dearly love. I am very pleased with him. And then the voice practically yelled, and I swear it was aimed directly at me, Listen to him! My knees buckled and I fell flat on the ground, trembling. It was a humbling, awesome moment I'll never forget. It was like being in the presence of the Almighty. Jesus came over and tapped us on the shoulder. He told the three of us to get up and not be afraid. Easy for him to say. When I looked up, the only one there was Jesus. I don't know what happened to the other two. Jesus led us back down the mountain, but made us swear that we wouldn't say a word about these strange happenings until the human one was raised from dead. He talks like that a lot in riddles. We often have to ask him what he means. I'm pretty sure he's the one. I do wish that we could have stayed up there longer, basking in that brilliant light and hearing more from that mysterious voice. The view was incredible. I even thought I saw the boat that I left in Galilee. But Jesus never stays in one place. I should have known. When I chose to follow him, I left my boat and my other life behind. Note to self, next time, don't make ridiculous suggestions in the middle of a miracle. It's Jesus, Peter. It's Jesus. Just follow him. May God add a blessing to the hearing of this holy word. Well, many years ago, KGO Talk Radio in San Francisco conducted a pretty shocking call-in poll. The host, Ron Owens, invited listeners to express their opinions. 
35% said yes, 33% said no, and 32% were undecided. One listener, aghast at the large number of undecideds, protested, it's this sort of apathy that's ruining America. The only problem with all these responses was that the radio station had never posed a question. I want to suggest that then, as is the case now, it may not, it's, it may not be so much apathy that is getting us in trouble. Rather, it might be that we are shooting our mouths off and shouting our lungs out over things that we know nothing about. It appears that the disciples may have behaved with surprising wisdom, therefore, after witnessing that brilliant moment and having an epiphany amidst this transfiguration event on an unnamed mountaintop. They did not understand what they had seen. They were amazed and awestruck at what they heard. They were confused. Considering how disturbing Jesus' first passion prediction must have been to the hearts of his disciples, think about what this moment was like for them. They had just returned from their first missionary excursion, flushed with success. Jesus had miraculously fed a crowd of 5,000, and Peter finally had the insight to name Jesus Messiah. Instead of praising Peter for his confession, though, Jesus responds by foretelling the ominous future that awaits him as the Messiah. To be specific about the context here, Jesus is on his way. He is setting his face to Jerusalem, where he knows a horrible fate awaits him. His mind must have been occupied with thoughts of his coming suffering and death, Perhaps he even wondered if, in fact, the kingdom of God could truly come through an event that would look to all the world like the failure of his life and mission. Amidst all of that, the transfiguration happens, and it thus serves as God's signature on the choice and the commitment that Jesus has made. In that sense, the primary audience for the whole event is Jesus himself. The very voice that commissioned him at his baptism comes again to assure him and the three disciples with him that the road ahead that leads to the cross is the right one. Clearly, God's statement about Jesus is the central focus of this incident, yet it is addressed to the three disciples and by extension, to us today. This is my son, my beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Think about it. As they joined him in this mountaintop prayer retreat, Peter, James, and John must have been deeply disturbed by Jesus's predictions. And then suddenly there are two prophets and dazzling lights and descending clouds and a voice too awesome to withstand. And the voice declares, this is my son. But it also orders the disciples to listen to him. How can Jesus be the Messiah, the son of the divine, at home in conversations with the likes of Moses and Elijah, and yet be doomed to the suffering and death that he has revealed to them? What kind of savior is this? Confused beyond reckoning, the disciples choose to say nothing and let the future unfold without their commentary. Beloved, despite the ubiquitous consumption of content, notwithstanding our penchant for chat rooms, in the face of our cultural lack of restraint of tongue and pen or thumb and send, there are times when saying nothing 
is the wisest insight we can offer, both individually and as a church. Sometimes the most significant, substantive, and spiritual thing we can do is to say nothing. Nowhere is it written that after we become Jesus followers, after we choose a spiritual practice of love and service and being of use, that we suddenly see all and know all and have an opinion on everything. In fact, there is a growing appreciation of the spiritual practice of not knowing. Both in Acts and at the end of his gospel, Luke records Jesus' commands to his disciple to stay in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power from on high. Other translations state that the disciples are to stay until they receive the word from on high. Sometimes we too need to be still stay in place, to meditate, to just sit and wait until the word and the power and the way from on high arrive. I don't know can be very good theology. And the practice of discernment is as faithful a spiritual practice as it gets. No one really knew, knows what happened during those six days that Jesus shared with the trio of disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. No one even really knows where the Mount of Transfiguration is. All we really know is that Jesus and his three closest friends climbed a mountain of prayer and entered the presence of God. Something wondrous and miraculous happened to them. Something so radiant and mystical that the afterglow never left Peter. Years later, Peter remembered this day different from all the other days and wrote, still in kind of a holy hush, we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. Our beloved friend, my colleague Mary Ludy, wrote a stunning sermon on the Transfiguration wherein she proposed a reframing of the typical criticism that we preach about Peter wanting to pitch a tent on the mountaintop. I know you've heard that story. Her beautifully written thesis challenged the progressive penchant for rushing off the mountaintop and getting down to work. Here's a bit of what she wrote. Yes, it is plain from the text that Jesus didn't want his friends to put up those three tents. Yes, Peter was befuddled by the strange experience and did not know what he said when he blurted out, it's good for us to be here. Yes, Jesus took them right back down and yes, they plunged into the hard, hard work of healing and teaching. There's no question that engagement with the world is an essential component of discipleship and that the suffering it brings requires disciples to have courage, determination, and perseverance. None of those things are glamorous. But we should also want to know why Jesus would show his friends the unutterable glory of God radiating through him and not mean for them to enjoy it. And why should we label Peter obtuse and ridiculous because he wants to make such beauty and such glory the very pleasure of God last and last and last. What the disciples received that day on the mountain was not a gallon of emergency gas or a quick breather for the work crew. It was a gift of mercy, pleasure, and love. They were given a glimpse of the richest and most fundamental truth about our lives, and they were meant to react to it precisely in the way they did, with awe. Just because it wasn't time for them to enjoy it permanently doesn't mean that they were wrong to want it permanently or that by wanting it so much they somehow missed the meaning of the event. 
Peter saw that the glory of God's mercy and deep pleasure rested uniquely upon Jesus, Mary goes on. This story is an epiphany after all, a story meant to reveal something of the character of God. Its main point is to clarify the identity of Jesus, and it does so in part through that awestruck wonder that this revelation causes in the disciples. But Peter must also have sensed that this transfiguring light was in some measure also about him, about us all, and for us all. The merciful pleasure God takes in Jesus, the joy of God's goodness that glows like a million suns, is Peter's origin and destiny too. It is the origin and destiny of the whole of creation. It is our origin and destiny. It is Ashiko's origin and destiny. It is the animals and the birds and the earth's origin and destiny. We were all made. It was all made in ecstasy and intended for ecstasy. Glory and its lovely twin, Mary writes, joy is the permanent subtext of our lives. Beloved, this is the glorious mystery of that moment, that we are the beloved too, and that Christ, to whom we are to listen, is our way, our truth, and our light. This holy hush moment, this never happened before nor since instant, this breathtaking, sight-blinding flash of WTF, this glorious, mysterious, unexplainable transfiguration took place during an experience of private meditation and prayer. It wasn't during a public speech or a sermon or one of Jesus's tutorials to his disciples. It was an intensely personal experience. While words may fail, nay, while words should fail after such a profound event, a genuine spiritual experience can easily withstand our inability to understand it. We need not talk an experience out in order to make it real. Yes? The Luke version of this moment says that the disciples saw his glory. Well, I want to tell you that high mountains stand in our scripture as places of revelation, glimpses of glory, experiences of revitalization, times of transfiguration. Think about it. There are only 14 summits in our world above 26,000 feet. The rarefied air of mountaintops is matched by their rarefied occurrence. Peaks in nature and in life don't happen often. Why has God been so sparing with holy places where the divine is manifested and divinations confirmed? Why doesn't God just talk to us directly like Morgan Freeman or Whoopi Goldberg in the movies? We don't know. It's a mystery. There are times when God has nothing to say, when God is silent, either waiting for us to speak to ask, to turn, or waiting for us to grow in wisdom, or airspace, or patience, or kindness. But when God answers by saying nothing, it is still an answer. Have you ever noticed that in large libraries there are whole floors devoted to reference books? We human beings like to be able to put our finger on the answer as quickly and as easily as possible. We don't like unknowing. And I don't know about you, but despite the fear of their being in complete control of, well, everything, I adore Google and its capacity to give me answers at any moment. And I'm starting to build a reasonably right relation with Alexa. So you could say that in our secular culture, in our time in history, 
an I don't know response is increasingly taken as a sign of laziness, not an admission of truth. Yet the soul, the human soul, and the church need to recognize that sometimes it takes more integrity and conviction to say nothing than to spout off. To know not, to know not creates the space, the airtime, the opening for the holy to inspire. In times of uncertainty, in the spaces between what was and what is to be, in processes of discernment about how to proceed, in relationships with each other, the spiritual practice of listening to Jesus through the beloved community and through the Holy Spirit that guides us is literally foundational to finding our way. Choosing to know nothing and say nothing isn't just an easy way out. Sometimes it is the way out to God. For God does not remain silent. It's just that sometimes God's word isn't as obvious as the movies make it out to be. Reverend Dr. Ludi writes later in that same transformative reflection this. In moments when God's glory breaks through our flat world of fact and rationality, in times when God's mercy transports us to the real, real world, the one that Jesus called the kingdom, full of justice and reconciliation, forbearance and peace, we are drawn inexorably to God like people who have been living sun-starved lives for years in caves. And we too want to pitch tents on the mountain. We want to stay and stay and stay. We know these moments. You know these moments. The flood of confusion the first time someone loves you. Yes, you. The time when you were forgiven, when you should never have been forgiven. The day you got through the whole of it without a drink. The night your first child was born. The moment you really heard the poet's question, what will I do with my one precious life? The time you turned on the news and found out that the wall was down and the tyrants were dead and people were crossing borders singing. Or the morning early when you went for a hike and the cloud that had threatened rain lifted suddenly and from the top of the mountain you saw clear to Canada and it took your breath away. And in the strange slanting light you felt somehow held, beloved, alive and it was like the first morning and you believed that it was possible to be new again. Even in the midst of the hardest grief, my beloved, it comes to us, this glory in some stillness, in a face, a touch, a piece of music, a, a place, a space, a smell. We know those moments and we have all wanted to pitch a tent on those heights and stay and stay and stay. It turns out that we cannot. Mary writes that the traditional interpretation of our story is correct about that. But the reason we cannot stay is not because it isn't good for us to be on the summit and desire such glory. It is in fact the supreme good. To want that glory is to desire God. And so my beloved dear ones, I leave you with this. God says, this is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. I pray that we might just listen. May it be so.